Brother Charles here. I want to talk to you about looking into the unseen realm. Have an eye, the spiritual eyes to see. You know, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe or tell somebody else about it. If you'd like, give us a thumbs up if you want. And uh, we do appreciate everyone that views us. And, uh, and we have a saying here, get into the Word and let the Word get into you. That's a wonderful thing. I'm going to start here in Matthew 13, 13. And he says something here in Matthew 13. This is Jesus talking. Amplified Bible, it says, This is the reason that I speak to them in parables, because having the power to see, see of seeing, they do not see, and having the power of hearing, they do not hear, nor do they grasp and understand. This is kind of powerful. He's not, now their eyes, they're looking at him. They're listening to him, but they're really not hearing what he's saying, and they're really not seeing what he's seeing. And uh, like one of the other rain prophets said something powerful. He goes, you people will never hear this message. He goes, it's, it's for the next generation. And that's something. Now, I'm leaving that alone, but there's things that are being said. That's why we need word. How, where does hearing come from? Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I know in my life, the more word I hear, the more word I eat and consume, the more understanding I have and the, and the better my eyes become into that realm of the Spirit. There's a lot of discernment that comes through the Word of God and a, a lot of understanding that comes through the Word of God. Now, in 14 it says, In them indeed is the prophecy fulfilled, uh, a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, You shall indeed hear and hear, but never grasp and understand. And you shall look, and look, but never see and perceive. This is the this is said. This is over and over again through the Gospels. I'm not here to bring a whole bunch of those out, but I want to take you into this realm and help you get your eyes open today. Verse 15, Matthew 13, 15. This nation's heart has grown gross, fat and dull, and their ears heavy and difficult of hearing. Their eyes they have tightly closed, lest, lest they see and perceive with their eyes and hear and comprehend the sense with their ears and grasp and understand with their heart and turn and I should heal them. Um, this is pretty, this is pretty, this is awesome. Let me give you the next verse. I wasn't going to do this, but I will. Because, you know, God's got a way of flipping the corner on Then he says the opposite thing to us, right? Blessed, but blessed, happy and fortunate to be envied are your eyes because they do see. And your ears, because they do hear. And this is wonderful. You know, I think this is awesome. Truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous men who were upright and in right standing with God yearned to see what you see and, to, and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not listen to it. You know, <laughs> this is pretty powerful. Then he says, listen to the meaning of the parable. Now, you know, these parables are written in a pretty powerful form. And I've seen some of them open up. 12 different ways for me and with different understanding and and I think it's important that we do that. You know, there's something that happened. Let, let me let me grab this Bible here. In Genesis, I do this in the finished work because I wish people realize the finished work and the power that's truly in the finished work. But what happened was the downfall of man. We know in Genesis 3, Satan came along, he added a word, took a word out, changed the words around, his power of deception. He he's done the same thing. For, two, for thousands of years now, nothing's changed. His, his tactics are the same. But now what happened to mankind? Well, they fell because they believed Satan's lie versus God's tremendous word, right? God's powerful word. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, so accurate. Anyway, now that was the downfall of man. But let me read you something here out of Genesis 3 and 6 and 7. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, so she could see this tree. And that it was good for fruit. So she had eyes to see here right now. And it says that it was pleasant to the eyes. I mean, so she could see this thing, right? Now listen to it. And the tree desirable to make one wise, she took the, its fruit and ate. And she gave, also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Now listen to what happened in verse 7 of Genesis 3. The eyes of both of them were open. Now wait a minute. They could see all this stuff before, but what eyes were open? Their natural eyes were open. They had never seen the, in any th other realm but into the supernatural realm. Now, listen to this. because And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, this is kind of amazing. We, go, we can back up to Genesis here in 2 and, two and, and 25, and we can see that, that they, they knew they were naked. 
but they they weren't ashamed, you know, and that amazing. Now this is kind of amazing here to me because now we've got man's natural eyes here. He's got his natural eyes and he's got his spiritual eyes. You know, I like the blind man when Jesus prayed for the blind man and his eyes were, then he said, what do you see? And he goes, I see men as trees. Right there, his eyes are open to the realm of the spirit because a man should be like a tree. But then he prayed for him again and then his complete natural eyes are opened. This is the way I see that. And then he could see just as you and I see into this natural realm. But now it's important that we that we grab the depths of this. You know, 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, we, we got a word here for us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, I'm going to read these to you. And uh, because, you know, if we're going to be doers of the word, then we're commissioned to do something here. And he says in 4 and 18, in 2 Corinthians, it says, Since we consider and look not at the things which are seen. So we look not at the things which are seen but to the things which are unseen. For the things that are visible are temporal, brief, fleeing, right? Temporal, they're subject to change. You can take this piece of paper here and light it, light it on fire, and in, in just minutes it would be ashes. It's subject to change. The realm of the supernatural can change the natural realm, but the natural realm cannot change the spiritual realm. I mean, that's a fact that people need to go and understand today. And God's raising up some people with this revelation for the things that are visible are temporal, flee, brief and fleeing, but the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. Now this is the commission of God, that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. We're not to look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. You see, the problem we have today, if people can understand, I mean, uh, well, I'll get into some of these. I'll, I'll show you some other realms here. But we got, my Bible says in Hebrews 12, we've come to Mount Zion and to an innumerable company of angels, right? I mean, so we live in a world that's ruled and governed by spirits, but natural man doesn't quite understand his under, how the power and authority that he has. I mean, you should break that first Corinthians. I mean, Hebrews 1 and 2 down. There you go. Break Hebrews 2 down for yourself. That would be powerful enough for you. And so I'm not here to get into angels and talk about all those things, but I know in my life when I began to study spirits, I thought that was kind of intriguing to me in the beginning of my walk. But then, you know, like I say, I began to study the spirit of infirmity. Hey, you know, after a while I could see that spirit working. But until I studied it, I didn't have I, I didn't have an understanding to see it. Or the unclean spirit, or the foul spirit, or, you know, so on and so forth. And so uh, you begin to study these realms and, and these spirits, and you begin to, and you know what, when you know them, they know you know them. And there's there's an honor system that goes there, right? Jesus said, hey, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. Hey, that's written to you too, but rather rejoice that your name is written in heaven. So there's a rejoicing that goes on. 5 and 7 of 2 Corinthians, it says, For we walk by faith, we regulate our eyes and uh, our lives and conduct ourselves by the conviction and belief and respecting man's relationship to God and divine things with trust and holy favor. We walk not by sight, or appearance, right? But how is that? But by faith. We walk not by sight, but by faith. And so now, you know, I, I, I want to, I don't want to jump ahead of myself here a little bit, but let's go back and let, let me give you a little understanding. I'm going to go over to Hebrews here in a little bit. Now, the numbers, let me show you something in numbers. It all the Old Testament, and there's too many of these for me to use. I want to take you here to numbers. Let's go to Numbers 22, if you're following me along here, that'd be great. And uh, in Numbers 22, and, and I, I don't know if I want to go to 22, 22, or 22 and 23, somewhere in here. It says, and God, let's go to 22 and 23. Now, you know, there's something that happens here, that even this donkey gets its spiritual eyes open into the realm here. Let's just do this one. 22 and 23, and the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way <clears throat> with his sword drawn in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way, right, and went into the field, and Balaam struck the donkey and turned her in the way. Now, that this, this donkey could see this angel. Verse 25, and when the donkey saw the angel, see, so this donkey's looking into the supernatural realm. Now, he's got more eye eyesight than the prophet, right? <laughs> Now, let, let, let's take it back to, to Elijah. Let's look at 31. I mean, it's not Elijah, excuse me. Balaam, 22 and 31. He says this. 
and 31. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel and the Lord standing in the way with his sword, right, drawn in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell on his face. Now, I'm not going to read all this context to you here, but I want you to realize God opened his Balaam's eyes that he could see this angel standing with a sword getting ready to kill him. You know, a hard knock your heart is in the day of provocation. That word of provocation is the provoking of angels. You can have your angels working for you or you can have them working against you. There's all kinds of examples of that and I've taught on that many times. And so it's the same thing. You can have the word working for you or you can have the word working against you. I'd rather be in the will of God doing what the word of God says and knowing that I have a heavenly soul host that's working with me and not against me, right? I mean, I'm trying to make some sense to you. He, he provoked his angel here. <laughs> I, I don't want to move into that and talk to you. Now, now think about it. Second Kings 6. We see something here. Real simple. Real simple prayer here. But what I'm trying to tell you here through this, Second Kings 6, let me get here first, is that every... Every person that had the Spirit of God upon them in the, in the Old Covenant, and I'm going to show this to you, was able to see into the supernatural realm. See, and, and, that, and now that I'm going to read this up to here in a minute. I'm going to put this into your court too because it's available for everybody to see in this realm. There's no respect to persons with God. You know, and I'm, we're not going to... I know in my walk, I went to a, a meeting one night. And I've, I've told the story once before. And... Uh, uh, the guy was, what he was teaching was a total lie. There was no truth in it. And I, I was like, oh my God, you know, and I, I said, God, allow me to see into the realm of the spirit. And he did. He opened my spiritual eyes and there was these demons about yay tall going around this guy's head. And I, I, blah, you know, I didn't scream or nothing, but it was like, I didn't ask to have my eyes open into that realm for a while, you know, but, but, uh, <laughs> The spirit of air was working, right? And they, I'll just say it, I'll just leave it at that. The spirit of air was working. And so, and, and it, I would like to tell that story sometime all the way into its fullness because I, it really brought some shock to me, but I decided then I really, I, what I teach, I want to make sure it's scripturally sound and I don't want to be teaching anything that's in error just because of that. Second Kings 6 and 17, he says this. I don't have this Bible marked up on this. It says here, uh, 6 and 17. It says, Then Elisha prayed, Lord, you open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Isn't that wonderful? Now, he's there in a cave, and he's praying, and there's 130 guys, if I remember right, this context, right up on him. And he goes out and goes, I lost my master. You know, come out here and look. And he goes, what are we going to do? And he goes, well, there's more of us than them. You read the context for yourself. And uh, he's going, one, two, one, two, 130, one, two, one, two. And he said, Lord, open his eyes and he may see. He didn't go into a big, long prayer meeting. He'd already had the prayer meeting in the cave. And uh, guess what? I believe prayer is something that gives your angels great strength and open your eyes to that realm more than anything else. Now, so we begin to see this all the way through the Old Covenant. I'm just giving you a few examples here because, you know, in, in Luke 24 and 31, I used this one recently. Let's just use this one. And I'm going to hit a couple here on our court. I'm going to move it. I'm going to take another, another course here. I'm reminding myself. Luke 24. You know, and Jesus is walking along here with his disciples. He's communing with them. They don't know it's him. They're talking the word, and he's walking with them. You can read this context, too. And they don't even know it's Jesus. And so we get here to 24 and 31. It says, now let me back up to 30. And it occurred as he reclined at the table with him. This is 24 and 30. All right. He looked at a loaf of bread and praised God. He took a loaf of bread and praised God, gave thanks, and blessed it in blessing. And he broke it and was given it to him. Guess what happened when they did this communion with Jesus? When their eyes were in instantly opened and they clearly recognized him and he vanished and departed visibly out of their sight. Now, so he had been with them all this time and they didn't even know it was Jesus. He was talking the word with them. And so now I just want to say that all of a sudden when he broke that bread with them, their eyes were opened. 
You know, in Ephesians 1 and 17 and 18, it says that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give unto you the spirit of wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Woo-hoo! That you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints. So, you know, there's a, there's a good prayer for you right there. That prayer I've been praying my whole life changes, changed my life more than anything else. There's all kinds of them that changed my life, but... That's one, because I want to know what my purpose and call is, right? And you should want yours too, because you're really not going to be happy until you break into that. You know, now let's go to Hebrews. I want to show you something here in Hebrews. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, you know, in Hebrews, God gave me a revelation of Hebrews, and it, it continues to grow. I'm not saying, I, I never put a cap on anything. That's the problem. That's how people get paralyzed in the realm of the Spirit, is they decide once they know something, they think they know it all, and they don't want they don't realize that there's more to know. And that there, I don't cap off anything. I tell people all the time, this is the way I see this now. I could in an hour tonight sleeping, I can have a vision in the morning and change everything I believe. I mean, it's just amazing how God works. It doesn't change the whole avenue, but the way I see something at that moment on that subject. Hebrews 11, 1, it says, now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed. The, of the things we hope for being the proof of things we do not see. Hello, faith. What is faith? It opens your spiritual eyes. Hebrews 11 isn't about a bunch of stuff getting you stuff. It's about people getting faith, getting their eyes open into the unseen realm. You know, there's, I mean, I'm not going to read you the entire book of Hebrews, but I'd love to. Now, <laughs> the hope for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. So my taste, touch, smell, see, and hear, that's not going to get what God wants me to see. I've got to get my five senses open into this realm of the Spirit. There's another, there's another spiritual realm that I want to get my eyes open to, right? I mean, come on, this is what we're talking about here. And just throw away your religious ideas. For by faith, trust and holy favor, born of faith, the men of old had divine testimony born to them, obtained a good report. By faith we understand that the world during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God, so that what we see, oh, that's this natural realm here. Well, what about what we see was not made of the things which are visible? Let me just go one more verse, all right? It says, prompted, activated by faith, able, Brought to God, brought God a better sacrifice, a better, more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, because of which it was testified of him that he was righteous and he was upright and in right standing with God and bore witness by accepting, God accepted his sacrifice, right? Acknowledging his gifts and through, and though he died, yet though through the incident, he is still speaking. Now, you know, Abel had to see the day of Christ. He took a lamb. He slaughtered that lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Oh, glory to God. And I came, Cain brought in his leaded glass windows and his brass hand railing and his marble floors, and he did everything but what God said. I'm trying to help you out. He did what he thought was pleasing to God. He was very religious, but he wasn't a doer of the word. And if you go down through this context, you'll see that everybody here saw the day of Christ. Let, let me just hit a few of these, okay, if you don't mind. Let's go to verse 7. Prompted by faith, Noah being forewarned by God concerning the events of which, which as yet there was no visible sign. Come on, come on, God had prompted him. Notice what he did. Took heed and diligently and reverently constructed and prepared an ark for the deliverance of his family. By, by this, his faith was relied on God. He passed God, he passed judgment and sentenced the world. Who did? Noah did. Unbe <laughs> the, the world's unbelief and become heir and possessor of righteousness. That relationship of God with right standing with God. You know, it says, Noah looking far into the future, the King James says. He looked, but eyes of faith, he looked far into the future. I mean, he was forewarned. My Bible says, and I'll read it to you here before this is over, the Bible, the, in John 16, 13, it says, the Holy Spirit's there to show us things to come. 
Hello, you have to believe that. You have to understand how to operate in that realm. I mean, it's time for people to get their eyes open and get out and begin to realize we're, we're moving in an unseen realm. Verse 13, now listen to this. It says, these people all died, controlled and sustained by their faith, but not having received the tangible fulfillment of God's promises, only having seen it and greeted it from a distance. But they saw the day of Christ. See right here. They saw it at a distance. They knew it was coming. Come on, how could... Well, I'll read, let me just read it to you. I, I don't want to quote it. Verse 20. It says, It says, With eyes of faith, Isaac looking far into the future, invoked blessing upon Jacob. Now, you know, I, I, I think there's something here that's powerful that, that people don't get, really get sometimes. Why would Abraham take his son up and sacrifice him as a type and shadow, knowing that God would raise him from the dead? That's what it says, as a type, as a pattern, because he's, that's how real the day of Christ was to him. It was so real that he was going to sacrifice his only son. I mean, if people would begin to read this word by the Spirit of God and begin to realize what it really is saying. Now, you know, I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to get some things out of you. You know, they, everyone saw the day of Christ. I, I just love that part. You know, let's go to, let's do this. John 8 and 56. Let's just wander through here and look at a few more things. In John 8 and 56, Jesus is talking here. He says, your forefather Abraham was extremely happy at the hope and the prospect of seeing my day. Abraham saw my day, he says. Now, this is pretty powerful. My incarnation. And he did see it and was delighted. Wow. I mean, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced, the King James said. You know, I mean, I think sometimes people don't realize that the power of the Holy Spirit that they got, they flip on the boob tube and they listen to all these end time disaster prophecies. They get full of fear. doesn't feed them any faith. And, and, and <laughs> they prepare themselves to fall out of shelters, and God forbid, but so on and so forth. But why? Because they don't understand what they have. Acts 2 and 25. Let's look at David here. I mean, I could, we could, this could be a, a week-long message here of all the people in the Word of God. Everyone saw the day of Christ. 2 and 25, he says this. David says, in regard to him, I saw the Lord constantly before me. For he is at my right hand, and that, that I may not be shaken or overthrown or cast down from my secure and happy state. Well, that's a good place to be. Don't you want to always see the Lord and not be cast down from your secure and happy place? Oh, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. That's where he was dwelling. He was dwelling in the tabernacle of God. He was in the tabernacle of David. I'm going to leave that alone. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue exalted exceedingly. Moreover, my flesh also will dwell in hope, will, in, will pitch its tent and dwell in hope in anticipation of the resurrection. For you will not abandon my soul, leaving it helpless in Hades, the state of departure of spirits, nor let your Holy One know and decay or see destruction of the body after death. Isn't that something? Yeah, I mean, this is powerful. He's talking about Jesus right here. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will, you will rapture me, diffusing my soul with joy, with, with, with and in your presence, right? In his presence there's fullness of joy. Verse 29, let me just jump down here to 31, all right? For he, foreseeing this, spoke. This is talking about David. He, foreseeing this, spoke. He saw the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw our day. Come on. I mean, we need to listen to this. And it says, by foreknowledge of the resurrection of Christ, the Messiah, that he was not deserted in death, left in Hades, the state of departure spirits, departed spirits, nor did his bodies know decay and see destruction. David foreseeing this. I mean, this is powerful. You know, I, I, I wish we people could just really get a hold of this. You know, Jesus said something in, in John 12 and 37. Let me back up here. In John 12 and 37, I see something that's really pretty good right here. 
And we see something here, John 12 and 37. I did all this out of the King James and I'm reading it out of here, so uh, it's just what I do sometimes, I guess. 12 and 37. It says, even though he had done so many miracles before them, right before their eyes, yet they still did not trust in him and failed to believe in him, so that what Isaiah the prophet said was fulfilled. Lord, who has believed our report and our message, and to whom has the arm of the power of the Lord been shown and revealed? Unveiled and revealed, this one says. Therefore they could not believe. They were unable to believe. For Isaiah also said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their benumbed, <laughs> callous, degenerated hearts. He has made their minds dull to keep them from seeing with their eyes and understanding with their hearts and their minds and, re and repenting and turning to me. Well, I mean, you know, this is, this, you know, listen to this part here Isaiah says in verse 41. Isaiah said this because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. So Isaiah even saw this. How could you not read that book and not see that? I mean, and so there's no respect to persons with God, right? Hebrews 2.9. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let me hit a few more things here for you because, you know, I, I think sometimes because, well, you see, Brother Charles, that was in the days of old. Well, I was still here in the days of new. I mean, we're, we're still at the close of this book. You know, John the Revelator, he had a revelation of Jesus Christ. I've taught on that. Revelation is to pull the curtain back and look inside. He personally knew Jesus, and we talked about that here recently in another one. Face to face, we are able to see Jesus. Hebrews 2 9. You are able to see Jesus. That's everybody under the sound of my voice who was ranked lower than the angels for a little while, crowned with glory and honor because of, of his having suffered death, in order that by the grace of God, right, he might experience death for what? Every individual. So we get a revelation of this and, and know that we can see Jesus. You know what, let me, let me do this. Let's do Romans 8, 24 and 25. Now we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen as yet, right? Talking about hope. And people, I watch them all, and I'm hoping for, they're hoping for a million dollars, and they're hoping for ten million dollars. And I've seen this so many times, and it just disgusts me, because faith is the, the, the substance of things hoped for, hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now let's just take the, but the definition of hope here is Romans 8 and 24, and he says this, For in this hope we were saved, but hope, the object of what is seen, is not hope. For how can one hope for what he already sees? Hello, come on. Now I want to go to the next verse. I'm not hoping for your car, I'm not hoping for your house, I'm not hoping for your money. I, I want you to get a hold of what we're talking about here. But if we hope, for what is still unseen, hello, faith is the acceptance of things hoped for, the evidence of not, things not seen as yet, right? By us, still unseen by us, we wait for it with patience and composure. I, I, I think that, that, I want to do you one more. I'm going to take this over to John 16, 13. You know, we're going to boil this out in a while. We know we're to walk by faith and not by sight. We're not to look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. God wouldn't tell you to do that if it wasn't able for you to do it, right? Come on. Eyes of faith looking far into the future. Now listen to this. 16, 13, Gospel of John. But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, the whole full truth. For he will not speak of his own message on his own authority, but he will tell you whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him, and he will announce and declare it to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. Well, I don't need to go listen to some prophet on TV. I don't need to go to prophecy conferences. Man, any man speaks in a tongue, he speaks unto God, God speaks unto him, revealing to him hidden things, secret things not obvious to the understanding. That's the connection you want, right? You want to be there. I want to be like Philip when God says, run to the chariot. I'm going to run to the chariot. Now, I'm not going to have to take a sponge and squeeze it out. 
I'm like, you know, that's where we want to be responsive to the things of the Holy Spirit. But we want to know those things to come, right? Come on, I'm trying to help you out. Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do. Uh, you know, now this is kind of powerful because, you know, he wasn't looking at a TV screen up in heaven and, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. No, he knew the nature of God. He was a pro, 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 prosonification. I need to drink a water, but I'll make it. Prosonification of God's word. He was the walking, living love of God. And, you know, and that's the same thing that God wants you to do. He wants you to have that total maturity and get your eyes open and your minds clear to the things of the Spirit of God. Right? Come on. Then, you know, Hebrews 4, 12. Uh, so the Holy Spirit's there to what? Show us things to come. Let me do this. Hebrews 4, 12. It wasn't part of my deal, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just take it one step further because without the Word of God, you know what? Your eyes will never get open. Without the Spirit of God, woo -hoo, I'll tell you what, it's going to slow you down a lot. And that's where that is. Hebrews 4, 12, he says this. The, for the word that God speaks is alive, woo -hoo, full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, the soul, and the immortal spirit, and of the joints, and of the marrow, and of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing, sifting, and analyzing, and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. I'll tell you what, the more I read the Word, the more discernment I have, the more understanding I have of spiritual things. Hey, if you really want to know what's going to happen in the future, just spend some time along. Just praying in the Spirit and listening to the Word of God. Listening to God, He'll show you what's coming. I mean, this is awesome. This corrupted world's going to be delivered into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Romans 8 and 21. You know, Revelation 11 15 says, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of this Christ. I'm telling you today, God's ushering his kingdom in. The devil's plant fear. He works through fear. Fear sells. I'm telling you, fear sells. But, you know, bless God, the truth is what people want. The truth is what people are looking for today. And so I urge you, hey, if you're on YouTube, hey, subscribe. Give us a like button. Tell somebody else about it. Get in the Word. Allow the Word to get into you. Father, I thank you. Seal this Word today. Give people a hunger to get their spiritual eyes. We anoint their eyes with eye salve today. That they can see, Father, that they may be able to see. Give them a hunger to see and perceive with their hearts. And we thank you for that today. Amen.